after the success of the video talking about how Garmin watches gets our VO2 max, I had a few questions around why there's two VO2 max readings, particularly for our multi-sport athletes, our triathletes who might have a cycling and a running VO2 max. Why are they different or sometimes why are they the same? Breaking down today, what is going on between our two different VO2 max readings on your Garmin? Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Nick here, talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Um, if you haven't watched the video talking about how Garmin estimates your VO2 max, I'm gonna link it above uh, in the card here, but also down in the description, so go watch that one first. But a few questions on the back of that video and the, the great success that video has had, and thanks for everyone who's watched it so far, um, is around two different VO2 max readings. And this is particularly uh, specific to triathletes, uh, multi-sport athletes, who might have a running VO2 max and a cycling VO2 max. Um, I know I get it, and sometimes there is a bit of variation between them, but sometimes those numbers can be exactly the same. So today we're just gonna break down exactly what some of those differences might be, why they're different, why also you might be seeing some similarities, um, and really just clear up the di the, the two readings uh, and what we what we should be seeing as a pattern across both, both sports. So I wanna start, I'm gonna throw up on the screen here um, some data from a professional triathlete, as a professional female triathlete, um, and show you what really should be happening when we're equally trained. And this is the perfect starting point is because when we're equally trained between cycling and running, we should have a pretty similar result. And what you can see here is on the bike, uh, VO2 max, we got a really high VO2 max, obviously a professional athlete of 74.9 mils per kilo per minute, um, which is a huge, huge volume of oxygen being used at the top end. Hence why they're a prof professional um, uh, triathlete there. But then you have a look at the, the run data now, 72.4 mils per kilo per minute, slightly lower if we're looking just at the raw numbers, but really in the grand scheme of things, it's not actually as much of a significant difference. Um, we're, we're talking very, very minimal. And in this case, what we've actually got is a, a running, running VO2 max is actually lower than our bike, which might be indicating in this case, knowing this athlete and having done their testing myself, in this case, it was heavily reliant on running economy being a big factor in performance at the top end of their um, the top end of their physiology. It's not necessarily about how much oxygen they could use; it was just how effectively they could use it. Um, so their economy played a really big part, and hence why that slightly lower number. What we get overall here is we get two very similar numbers. And what I'm getting at is when we're really highly trained and almost equally trained in both cycling and running, we should see pretty much the same VO2 max. We shouldn't see too much variation between because it is our maximal oxygen consumption for that workload. And, and what we have at the elite end of the spectrum with those types of athletes who are perfectly trained um, equally in both bike and run, the, the comparative output of that athlete cycling wise versus running, they're putting out the same amount of work. Um, and it would make sense that if they're putting out the same amount of work at the same um, high level, that we would have very similar VO2 max readings at the top end of their engine. Their engine is as big as it can get to in both of those disciplines. Before we get too much into Different, clearly different VO2 max numbers, how it can actually be very, very different makeups of VO2 max, even within that, that perfect example. So if I bring back up on the screen here, just have a quick look at uh, this pro's bike data again, where we said the VO2 max was 74.9. You'll actually notice that ventilation, so the total amount of air they could take in per minute, just getting air into the lungs, was 152 liters of air per minute. If we have a quick look at the run, it was only 130 liters at VO2 max, that bolded line there. So what we've got is a 22 litre difference in ventilation. Now, part of that error is gonna be a little bit in the equipment. We're gonna get that with any lab test. You need a slight bit of error um, in the result, but a large part of it is running wise, we've got a lot of vertical impact coming through the body. So the lungs tend to, and the diaphragm tend to shorten up a bit. It's a lot harder to get that really deep breath in. Cycling, bent over on the bike, nice relaxed through the torso, really easy to get that deep breath. So from a cycling perspective, we're able to get more air in a little bit more effectively. So supply of oxygen into the body is gonna be a lot higher to begin with. However, when we look at FeO2 uh, as a measure, uh, which we'll have, a, I'll chuck up on the screen again. If we have a look at the FeO2 percentage at VO2 max, significantly better, we want this number to be lower because this is measuring the percentage of oxygen that we're breathing back out, a fraction of expired oxygen. Gives us an indication of how much oxygen we're using in the body. So ideally we want this number to be as low as possible because if we're breathing out less, it means we're using more. And you can actually see it's significantly lower on the run compared to the bike. And why is that the case? When we're on the bike, arms and torso aren't really doing a lot. When we're running, um, arms are moving, arms are swinging, might have a bit of torso movement as well. There's a lot more muscle mass involved potentially taking up some of that percentage of oxygen. But because we've lost out a little bit on that ventilation, it sort of count, it counterbalances itself out. And hence why we end up with similar readings is the, the take-in transport utilizer is still happening overall to the same effect. In terms of our definition of VO2 max, it's the maximum amount we can take in transport and utilize in one minute. 
that whole process equals the same output. It's just we've manipulated the variables within it to then create that same output. Um, it, it's it's just how the body's made it up. Even if we want to have a look at heart rate as well, the transport mechanism, you can see here, um, our running heart rate is significantly high, five beats higher. We see that's very typical across any athlete, professional or non-professional, five to even 10 beats higher on the run than the bike. Why? More muscle mass involved, more blood being sent around to the arms, torso, etc. cetera. Um, it is going to result in a higher heart rate. So even with an athlete who's got the same VO2 max across both and equally trained, we do see some individual physiological variation um, because of the, the demands of the sport. Obviously, cycling, we're predominantly leg dominant, nothing really happening up top. There's no need for us to send a lot of blood flow to the, to the torso and the arms. Um, not much need for the arms to be using a lot of oxygen. We want to send it every, every last bit of it to the legs to be able to produce all that power. Whereas running-wise, it needs to be distributed a bit more evenly. But like I said, overall taking transport utilized ends up being the same uh, same overall output. If we want to look at differences now, why might an athlete have a higher running VO2 than a, than a cycling VO2 or vice versa? Typically, it comes down to a couple of those factors. First of all, it's going to come down to, are you lesser trained in either one of those? So where we have a case of a non-professional athlete, if you're or even a professional athlete who's transitioning sports, so if we go from um, running only to triathlon, lesser trained in the cycling aspect, probably going to fatigue quicker in a test and hence when we do a test we're not going to get to our genuine vo2 max um, so we might say our cycling vo2 max is a little bit lower or you can't perform to the same comparative level on the bike as you can from a running perspective that's a really easy one to then first kick off are you lesser trained in one mode of activity so are you lesser trained cyclist or a lesser trained runner comparatively whichever one you're lesser trained in and i know for me i'm more of a runner than i'm a cyclist my cycling VO2 is always a couple of points uh, lower than what my running VO2 is, purely from the fact that I can't output the same comparative wattage on the bike as pace that I can do running-wise at VO2 max. Another one is largely for amateur athletes who, who aren't professionals, again, um, but this can also um, happen at the elite level. We see this right at the top end with highest VO2 max is ever recorded. Typically, it's dominated that, that list is dominated by cross-country skiers, interestingly enough mostly because of the muscle groups involved. And I already touched on this before, the amount of muscle mass involved can play a bit of a difference in how we make up VO2 max. But comparing athletes of just pure cross-country skier versus pure cyclist, that's where we can also see some pretty clear variation. Obviously, cross-country skier, using lots of the arms, lots of the upper body, but also using heaps and legs. Cyclists, predominantly leg dominant. So where we might see a really elite cyclist hit maybe 85, 86 VO2, some of them have got into the 90s for short periods, um, we typically see the cross-country skiers are also going to have a significant advantage um, in terms of being able to more easily get to that 90 um, as well. Typically, cross-country skiers are quite tall. Uh, long levers gives them better um, better advantage from a technique perspective. Cyclists, depending on the type of cyclist, typically the endurance cyclists are, are quite lean, generally not very tall. Some of them are, but your best hill climbers who tend to have the highest relative VO2 maxes are going to be quite short and, and they want to be as light as possible, whereas cross-country ski is a little bit different story need a bit of mass behind you obviously for the downhill section to be as fast, fast as possible so extra muscle mass is going to help being tall you're going to have extra muscle mass anyway um, but then also they're reasonably lean for their height so they're able to get up the hills quickly and that can play a bit of a factor too um, another side of it for a cross-country skier is obviously the altitude effect they they have to be at altitude when they train because that's where the snow is cyclists we don't have to train altitude can get a good stimulus out of it i might cover that in, a, in another video about ways we can improve vo2 max outside of just training and talk about altitude and things like that but it's it's the type of thing that cross-country skiers can be an advantage purely from the fact that they're using more muscle groups um, and when we're talking that dramatic difference just so in a bit of summary you, it's typical to see a bit of variation between your vo2 max numbers that's okay typically it's not going to be by a lot if it is by a lot it is usually down to a training difference so are you more trained in cycling or running or are you focusing more on your bike than the run at the, at the moment um what are your inputs? Making sure, like I spoke about in that, how does Garmin get VO2 max in the first place? Making sure your inputs are all correct so you're getting accurate heart rate, power, pace, etc. Um, it's okay to see a bit of variation. Don't don't freak out, but they should be reasonably close um, if you are comparatively trained in both of them. So hopefully that answers some of the questions around differences in cycling and running VO2 max. If you do have any more questions on VO2 max, please leave some in the comments below. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, it's great to see so many people are subscribing already. Uh, and like I said, check out the video on how Garmin estimates VO2 max. Uh, I'll link it above, but then also put it in the description below. Um, go watch that one and then come back and revisit this one to, to fully understand VO2 max on your Garmin watch. Um, hopefully you enjoyed today's video and we'll see you in the next one.